Excellent. Well, it's, uh, it's a blessing to be with you. I want to thank Norma Sitt for her work uh, organizing these meetings. And it is very encouraging to see Christians around the world who love Jesus and want to see the Great Commission fulfilled and uh, have a heart now even for Muslim people. So uh, what we're going to do in this session on my part of the time is uh, last week we talked about some current trends in sharing the gospel with Muslims. And in this session, we're going to talk a little bit about popular Islam. It's most likely the kind of Islam you will see more commonly in Southeast Asia, although in places like Indonesia and in Malaysia uh, and in uh, other areas, really, the Islamic fundamentalists are moving to try to purify Islam or uh, make Islam more according to the Quran. But nevertheless, we see in throughout the world and particularly in Southeast Asia, a lot of um, popular Islam. Sometimes it's called folk Islam, uh, which is another way of saying the people's Islam. And that's really a mixture of Islam and animism. So uh, we're going to talk about that in two, uh, for two reasons. One is that so as you're ministering to Muslims, uh, you will know these things and you will have this training. And secondly, and equally important, is for prayer purposes. So that as you're interceding for Muslim people, you'll be interceding for the deliverance, for the healing, for the impartation of the word of God. And as, uh, as Sister Norma has said, uh, the healing is so important. And uh, just by way of an example, uh, I'll be sharing screen in a minute, but I have an Indonesian pastor friend. I don't know exactly where he's from. I think Java. But when he was a young man, he was a Muslim and he was being mentored by the imam or the mullah of the, of the mosque. And the, the mullah or the imam, the priest, was really just a witch doctor. And he gave this young man an amulet, uh, something to wear uh, around his neck, under his clothes, and it was body part of a tiger. And he said, this is so powerful. This has so much magic in it that if anyone cuts you with a knife or a sword in a fight or war or anything like that, you won't bleed. So you can imagine how much young men uh, maybe want that. If they happen to be in a fight, they would be cut and they wouldn't bleed. So he had this and he used to always wear it under his shirt. Well, some time passed and this young man met a Christian and the Christian began witnessing to him and uh, the, the Muslim man eventually received Jesus Christ. And so uh, the Christian said, uh, you know, I'd like to pray with you to receive Jesus Christ. And he said, are you willing to pray? And he said, yes. So this is happening in Indonesia. And as they bowed to pray, the Christian somehow sensed something was wrong. And he said to his new friend, the, the Muslim that was accepting Jesus, do you have any kind of charms, any kind of magic, uh, you know, amulets on your, on your person? And the, and the young man said, yes, I do. Uh, I've been given this by my mentor, the imam. And this is from the body part of a tiger. And this is so powerful that if I have this, no one can harm me and I won't bleed. So uh, the Christian said, you know what? If you're going to receive Jesus Christ, you have to trust in Jesus and Jesus will protect you. You must get away from all of those type of things. And so what we should do before you accept Jesus Christ, we're going to take that and put it outside in a fire and burn it. And so the young man said, I'm willing to do that. So they took that from the tiger. They went out, they made a fire, and they burnt it. And then the young man prayed to receive Jesus Christ. Now, as soon as he lifted up his eyes from prayer, he said, I want to try something. And he took a little piece of glass from the ground, and he, he cut his arm, uh, his hand, not to injure, just to test. And he said, in the past, whenever I was cut, I would never bleed. He did the cut then and some blood came out and he said, now I know Jesus Christ is stronger than that magic that I had. And, and he is still serving the Lord to this day and became a pastor. So uh, it is exciting to see what God is doing. And what we'll do is uh, I'd like to reserve as much time as we can 
for the uh, questions and answers and discussion. Last time we had a very fruitful questions and answers and discussion. And uh, there were some questions, they were spoken and some came in the chat box. So um, I'm gonna try to uh, spend about 30 or 40 minutes doing a teaching and I'll try to reserve the rest of the time for the discussion because that's very fruitful. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna share a screen of a PowerPoint that is available. And I thank uh, those who have translated both last week and this week, it's been a big, big help. And so I want to see if you can, uh, if you can see uh, that and let me uh, see if I can make my screen move a little bit. Slide show from beginning. This time I'm hoping it's gonna work better. Um, can you see that now? Uh, or is it coming with two screens again? Is it doing that? We can see, we can see the side bar. Uh, ah. So, yep. When I tested that earlier, it wasn't but doing I think it. It's, it's okay if, you know. Uh, okay. Maybe let me, uh, the side a little yeah, bit. Yeah, let me like shrink that. that part like that. Yep. How is that? Can you Excellent. see that okay? Yep, I think that's. Okay. Yep, great. Let's, uh, so this is uh, some material on folk Islam, which is the people's Islam power encounter and spiritual warfare. This will be um, important as I mentioned in this testimonial that part of the discipleship process is for converts to Christ from Islam to put away demonic practices and replace them with reliance on Jesus and the Holy Spirit to meet their felt needs or their perceived needs. You can see that um, it's not just about beliefs. It's not just about having a creed or to testify something, but it's also in the practical living to see the power of God manifest. Now, what is popular Islam? What is folk Islam? Well, we can define it like this. Folk Islam is the quest of Muslim people to find spiritual protection and deliverance in a world full of powerful spirits. They do this in a context or various contexts in which they do not believe in a personal or loving God, nor do they believe in Jesus Christ as Lord who has power over all spirits. Now, uh, let me just comment here that you might find some Muslims, they say, well, we believe in a loving God or we believe we are closer to God than you Christians are. But in fact, uh, outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, we know that no person has a relationship with God. You might find a Muslim, they may say, I feel so close to God. And maybe you as a Christian or me as a Christian, we're going through a dry season where it just seems like, God, I don't feel your presence. It's not about feelings, brothers and sisters. It's about the blood of Jesus Christ that brings us into a real relationship with God and no deception, no uh, emotion, uh, which are, Emotion is fine. Feeling is fine, of course. It's not something that God doesn't care about. But you might find Muslims that they could be mystics and they say, I am um, trying to find a union with God. Now, this is not part of classical Islam, but in the Sufi mystical area, you find this among some Muslims. I just want to share with you in your prayer and in your testimony, if you find Muslims that uh, say, you know, we feel close to God, we know that it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ that a person can become saved. So please keep that in mind. And Muslims sadly, sadly, sadly don't have that. The, uh, the main feature of folk Islam is fear. Even the young man who took the part from the tiger, he was afraid of being hurt. So the folk Islam gave him the amulet, which is just uh, paganism, just animism. And so we see that the main feature in folk Islam is fear. Muslims seek refuge. Uh, it's a prayer that Muslims pray, saying, Kul a'udhu, I seek refuge in Allah. But they cannot be assured that Allah loves them or has the best interests of them in mind. The only one who can assure them of victory over evil is the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to destroy the works of the devil. So in 1 John 3, 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the son of God, came to destroy the works of the devil. But yet Islam denies Jesus as Lord. Uh, the Quran says this, and 
It's a strange and interesting thing in the Quran. Allah, the God of the Quran, often speaks in the royal we, even though Islam completely denies the Trinity or any plurality in the Godhead. But uh, the Quran says in the 32nd surah or chapter, verse 13, if we, Allah is saying, if we had willed, we could have brought every soul to its true guidance. We could have brought every soul to its true guidance. But the word from me will come true. I will fill hell with jinn, which are a type of spirits, and men altogether. So uh, we see, for example, in the Bible, in 2 Peter 3, 9, that God doesn't desire any to re, uh, perish, but all to come to repentance. But you see the difference here. Allah in the Quran is saying, I will fill hell with men. I could have brought everyone to the guidance that they need, but I'm going to fill hell with people. So you can see that there's a fear-based situation. There's not a personal relationship with God. And that's just part of the Islamic worldview, paradigm, and so forth. So what do Muslims do? They resort to paganism, to animism. And we'll unpack this further. So uh, just a very short outline is that we'll talk a little bit about animism. We'll talk about spiritual and material causality. And then the bulk of the time, we'll talk about the sources of power in folk Islam. And uh, I know the chat is uh, running here, and I'm going to click on it just so um, there, if there are questions, you can post them in the chat, and we'll come back to them. Uh, I, was, I normally, in my lectures uh, live, I like to do the questions simultaneously whenever you have them. The issue here would be some people may ask questions that we will touch on later. So I thought as much as we can, and with the chat box and with the share screen, it would probably be easier just to uh, take the questions uh, and the discussion at the end, because I'd like to hear your comments. We're talking about a lot of different countries, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and I uh, have never been to Thailand. So may God bless you all in your ministry there, because we have Muslims in those countries. And Muslims would like to see the Christians of every country become Muslims themselves. So that's something to think about. So next, uh, let me come back here. So animism, this is important. And for those of you in Asia, you're probably very familiar about that. Uh, animism is the worldview that spirits animate or enliven objects and people. So folk Muslims, they tend to be animistic. Animism is marked by bondage, bondage to and worship of evil spirits. Therefore, animism is closely related to idolatry. So a little bit more on animism. There's a few points and we'll read them because this will really help you understand the world of the folk Muslim or the, the Muslims in so many uh, places. Africa is very much uh, inundated with folk Islam. Uh, we're serving in Albania and Albania is uh, very, very much, even though it was a communist country, there's a lot of folk Islam there. And uh, the people put the little teddy bears on their, uh, doors of their homes and uh, little dolls. Uh, and the reason for that is that if there is an evil spirit that's going to attack someone in the home, they want the evil spirit to attack the doll or the teddy bear or the stuffed animal that's on the front of the home instead of the people inside. So they want to trick the evil spirit. So this is common everywhere. Now, about animism, if people use their free will to worship anything other than God himself, it is idolatry. Now, idolatry is an invitation for the devil and evil spirits to oppress or possess the idolater. So the idolatry opens the door to the enemy. So I have a, I have a friend in ministry in, uh, in Israel. He works among Palestinians. He's himself Palestinian. His, his method of evangelism among Muslims is purely deliverance because he says all of the Muslims that he knows, and so many, I, I shouldn't say everyone, but the, the majority, they are talking to evil spirits that they think are helping them. And in doing so, they've opened the door. So when they open that door and evil spirits have come in, they need deliverance. Now, what do these devil and demons seek? They seek worship in the form of sacrifice. 
And if we want to speak about uh, common uh, commonalities, you see in the Muslim world, even among the uh, Wahhabis or the fundamentalists, they're saying you should sacrifice yourself. You should be willing to die as a martyr in the holy war. So you see a difference in, in, in the Bible, Jesus dies for us. And then we are set free. And by that freedom, we are willing to serve him. Whether that means a persecution, whether that means finding ourselves in a jail, but we're willing to serve him. Uh, in Islam, it's much more of a binding situation as you'll find in any form of animism. Last uh, slide on animism is when people worship and give their devotion and sacrifice to someone, something or someplace, that person, thing or place can become animated by an evil spirit. We'll see some examples of that. The idol worshiper may be aware or unaware of the spiritual dimension. They just may think we always do that. Uh, I would ask people in Albania, why do you put those things on the outside of the house? And they would laugh and they would chuckle. They, they would say, well, we always did this, but they really maybe wouldn't know where they were embarrassed to say. I, so um, sometimes people are not fully aware. Now, if idolatry happens on a community basis, a demonic stronghold will be formed and can become entrenched. So this is a, a, a challenge. We saw this in Ephesus in Acts 19, where the people became, uh, they had a, a covenant with the goddess Artemis. And as soon as that covenant was challenged, big persecution broke out. So some of this persecution we may talk about in Malaysia and other places, it's because demonic strongholds are being challenged and then those demonic forces are riling up. They're fomenting people that want to uh, carry on that idolatry to persecute Christians as they, that they see as a threat. These are all in the spiritual. So, so do we see this in the Bible? Yes, we do. Remember the golden calf? Uh, the people, they got their gold off and they put it in the fire and Aaron was there, but Moses was up on the mountain. They made a golden calf. And they bow down and say, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. Wow, what a departure. Immediately they began partying. They be, got into immorality, uh, drunkenness. I mean, everything happened to them because of this demonic uh, deception that happened. Moses' heart was broken. God's heart was broken. Remember Gideon's ephod? Gideon led a great victory of the people of God over Midian, but then... He, uh, he had made an ephod and it said the children of Israel in Judges 8.27 went and they played the harlot. They, they committed idolatry with the uh, golden ephod. Uh, what is a spiritual and material causality? Well, um, animism is based on the concept of spiritual causality, which is absent in materialism. So let's take an example. Let's talk about coronavirus. Um, a lot of people in most of the world, they're talking about material causality. Some virus has happened and some virus has um, transmitted from people to people. And if we stop people from traveling, hopefully the virus will stop. If they wear a mask, they get uh, some injection of a vaccine. Supposedly this will help. There were some Muslims actually uh, in, in the Middle East that part of their religious uh, custom is they go and they visit shrines and they would touch the shrines for blessing. They would even kiss the shrine. And there was a video, which I can't load here at the moment, of young people. They were saying, we don't care about coronavirus. And they were licking, they were licking with their tongues and their mouth the same part of the shrine where hundreds and thousands of people have touched. They say, if Allah wants to keep us free from coronavirus, then it doesn't matter. We can even lick the shrine. But if, if he wants us to get it, then we're going to get it anyway, even if we wear a mask. So uh, that's the difference between material and spiritual causality. Now, you find some Muslims, they use both. They may go to the doctor and the witch doctor. They may take the medicine and they may take the charm. So we'll talk about this as we go along. Uh, remember Herod in the New Testament? And it says in Matthew 14, 1 and 2, this is, in, of course, in the Bible, Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus, okay? And he said, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. 
And that is why miraculous powers are working in him. A lot of faith, I would say, for Farad, for a, for a very worldly, uh, you know, ruler. Uh, he sees miracles and he goes, I know what happened. John the Baptist is risen from the dead. I mean, that's a lot of faith. But he believed in spiritual causality, as a, apparently from this text. And there is others. Okay. Now we make our transition to sources of power in folk Islam. And um, I will try not to keep looking at the chat because... Uh, I'll take the questions at the end. So that's fine. But you can load up your questions, even in Thai, uh, or if any language, uh, someone can translate it if you need to type in Chinese or some other language. In Islam, folk Islam, we're talking about power. Now, we said that Jesus has the power to destroy the works of the devil. But in folk Islam, you have power people, power persons, power places power colors, power objects, power words, and power directions. And also, lastly, blessing, cursing, and dreams. So we'll unpack these now. We have, in the case of the power people, these can include dead saints, like those saints that people will go visit their shrines, holy people such as Muhammad, Sufi saints, Shiite imams. This is a picture of Imam Ali. And they could be living persons, the witch doctors, uh, marabouts, saints. And these are considered people that have power. None of these are Jesus Christ. They are people that are either living or dead. And these are considered that those that have power. Especially Muhammad would be a power person. Um, now, this is interesting because Muhammad in the Quran said that he is one who warns. He warns people about the coming judgment and the life after death, and not to worship idols. But when Muslims started interacting with Christians, is my inter understanding, my interpretation, they became embarrassed because Jesus is doing so many miracles. Even the Quran says this. But Muhammad said, I have no miracle except the Quran. Uh, and then they started coming up with stories, <coughs> excuse me, of Muhammad's miracles. And uh, these uh, would be primarily not in the Quran, but in the traditions. Uh, this is a story from Muhammad's life. Uh, again, you see the biblical similarities almost everywhere. There is a story that Muhammad was taking a caravan ride to Syria when he was 12. Of course, who went on a uh, caravan to Jerusalem when he was 12? Jesus, right? So Muhammad is going, and a Nestorian Christian monk named Bahira saw this caravan, and he felt that there was a prophet in this caravan. And lo and behold, he noticed the sign of a prophet, which was a mark between the shoulder blades of this young boy, Muhammad, and said, this boy is a prophet. Shield him from the Jews because they will attack him. And so these stories, uh, larger than life stories, uh, surround the life of Muhammad. He is the ultimate power person in popular Islam. Uh, in in uh, Islam, you have a lot of magicians, uh, witches, witchcraft, shamans. Um, and the Quran speaks of those who blow into knots. So if you have a, a string and you tie it in a knot, and sometimes they say, who can untie this knot? Um, Alexander the Great, you know, when he went to, uh, he, he, un, he couldn't, there was a knot that couldn't be untied called the Gordian knot. And they said, whoever will untie this knot will rule the world. And he just took out his sword and he cut the knot in half. But the, uh, what the magicians do, is, is they, they blow into knots and they untie them. And it's just a form of what they call magic. Well, this is very common in folk Islam. You have people that are reading tea leaves, reading coffee grinds. All of that is part of uh, the, the magic that they're looking to for direction, looking for guidance for the future. And they do this through magic. And magi magicians very common throughout the Muslim world, and you'll see this in folk Islam. Now, as Christians, we know the true power person is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and we must teach and model this for Muslim background believers. Like that uh, Indonesian Christian who led the Indonesian Muslim to the Lord, he modeled and he taught that young man that you cannot rely on power on amulets and charms. If, if he had let that go, that young man would have been 
unable to walk into freedom in Christ. He probably would have never became a pastor because he would have been trusting in charms and amulets instead of in the blood of Jesus Christ. So be in mind of that. Now we talk about power places. These are often places of pilgrimage. Uh, the Kaaba, for example. Um, I had an interesting uh, situation. I was, uh, I, was in, uh, I was in Dubai and I was uh, traveling to Indonesia. I was connecting uh, on Emirates Air. And it just so happened that there was about, the whole flight going to Jakarta was full of people coming back from the Hajj and they were connecting through Dubai. And many of the people were women and they were very proud and happy. And they were wearing white gowns with a blue, nice blue sash. And they had a new title, Haji. Just so happened that almost all of the people had gotten sick and they were all coughing. This was before COVID. 200 people in the airport port, you know, the gate, they call it gate. They're all sick. And uh, they had gone to Mecca and uh, I thought, boy, we need a healing crusade here. Should I jump up on the counter and start preaching? But all of these people, they went to Mecca and they, they ended up getting sick there. But they certainly were happy because they fulfilled an obligation of Islam and they went to the power place. And you have many of these places. In Iraq, you have uh, in Karbala, the uh, Imam Hussein, who is the grandson of Muhammad, it's a top picture. His uh, tomb is there. He was supposedly martyred according to history and buried there. Uh, they said after his head, head was cut off, his head was uh, still speaking. His mouth was still speaking verses of the Quran. This would probably be a legend, uh, of course, uh, but they would say it as a miracle because in folk Islam, they like miracles. The bottom is Meshhed, which is in Iran, the tomb of Imam Reza. And that is also a place of pilgrimage. So these are power places. Now you have negative power places. For example, cemeteries where people are buried, uh, garbage dumps. These are places where evil spirits are thought to live. And if you get close to the garbage, an uh, evil spirit could attack you, things like that. So uh, this is very much part of folk Islam. If you have commentary from your part of the world, uh, it doesn't only have to be questions, but if you have brief comments about what's going on with folk Islam in your part of the world, I would like to hear that. And I'm sure that others would too. What is the power encounter? Well, we as Christians know that the place of power is in the presence of God. Yes, the place of power is in the presence of God. And we must teach and model this for Muslim background believers. It's not going to some shrine or licking some tomb or having some amulet or going to Mecca. It's being in the presence of God, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is the place of power. How about colors? Well, uh, you have green is the color of Muhammad and uh, the color turquoise or blue green. It's thought to have power to ward off the evil eye. In ISIS, they're liking to use the color black. Same thing with Taliban. Uh, that's the color they're using. But the main color of Islam is, uh, is green. And you're seeing a lot of Islamic flags, not all, but in many, you see green, fully green like Saudi Arabia or partially green. Um, and this is representing the, the power of the color of Muhammad. Uh, let me just mention, we used to live in Cyprus and uh, the, even though the, the people there were primarily Christian, all of their doors and shutters, at least in the old city of Nicosia, they painted them this same turquoise color blue, light blue green. And I think it was because of something they picked up from the Ottomans uh, that was Turkish rule. And so they um, still kept this. So Christians sometimes can pick up these things. So if I ask you in your context, do Christians wear charms? Uh, do Christians... Uh, have objects they think are powerful uh, and how do you deal with that so the muslims have a lot of these things and you have to think about them because sometimes they give them as gifts on the left here you see a quran stand and they give them to you as a gift what do you do you have to be very discerning about that uh, here's a prayer mat specifically made on the right for praying toward mecca you can see the 
uh, directional style of it. There's other rugs that are not specifically Islamic. Then all kinds of amulets, charms, jewelry. Um, the, the daughter of uh, Muhammad and uh, Khadija was named Fatima. And there is something called the hand of Fatima. Uh, they often put it on door hinges or door knockers so that uh, if, if I look into that house, say an evil person or someone looks into that house with evil intent, that hand of Fatima blocks the, um, the uh, power of the evil or the power of the envy. And so they, they use this very widely in the Muslim world. And if you have some testimonials, you can feel free to share them because we'll be coming before too long to the discussion time. Um, Muslims will often drink water from a bowl which has verses of the Quran written in it. They will write the verses in ink and then they rub them off or they have it pre-printed. And this would be an example of spiritual causality and the power object to heal. So they're looking for healing, but how can they find that healing? And sometimes it's their deliverance from demons. How can they find it? Uh, they think sometimes the sickness is caused by demons. So what better place for Muslim to get some words from the Quran into your body? Uh, here's some more words. So you might see, this is a Sufi mystic. They might go into a trance. We have our Pentecostals, but the Muslims have their mystics too. And they go into a trance, chanting the name of Allah. Uh, you might hear other words chanted. Uh, Bismillah means in the name of Allah. It's usually used for good luck. The Muslims will say this when they're about to start any endeavor. You hear the word mashallah, uh, and that is thought to ward off the evil eye. The mashallah means whatever Allah wills. So, uh, and when someone sees a baby, instead of saying the baby is cute, the baby is beautiful, they will say mashallah, meaning whatever Allah wills. I'm not coveting this baby. I'm not saying this baby is adorable because I that might be interpreted as an evil desire uh, to have that baby. So. Muslims will often use uh, prayer beads. They, they may have got this from Catholic tradition. Uh, I don't know exactly, but they call these tasbih, which means praise. And they'll often use these to recite what is often called uh, the isma al-husna, the 99 beautiful names of Allah. Some of the uh, those prayer beads, they have 33. So you can name the names of Allah 33 times. Uh, there would be 33 and going around three times, you would have 99. And there's all kinds of traditions. Uh, the Muslims, you know, in, in, uh, in Arabic, the word, the number for one is like in, uh, in European languages is just up and down. Uh, and the, the number for eight is, looks like a, looks like a V or it looks like a, uh, of course, in Thai, sorry, my sister, you don't have those same letters, but uh, it would look like that. And so uh, the number 18, the number 18 would look like this in Islam. That's the number 18. And this is the number 81, depending on which, how you're looking. And so the Muslims will say, if you look at your hands, you see on my hands, I have a, a one and, a, and an eight. On the other hand, I have an eight and a one. You see the line? One and eight. Look at your hands. Hold your hands up in front of the camera. No, you don't have to. You can look at your hands. So the Muslims will say, when I hold up my hands in prayer, I'm lifting up the 99 names of Allah. And they, they believe this reinforces their faith. Uh, so a lot of this is happening. How about the power encounter? As Christians, we know that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' name is the most powerful name, and so this is the name that demons fear. When you go into Muslim world, and you're proclaiming the name of Jesus, the Son of God, not only uh, is there a potential for upset or persecution, the demons themselves are nervous the demons themselves are threatened i'm not saying every muslim is demon possessed by any means i don't mean that but i think for those of you who are spiritual prayer warriors you understand what i'm talking about we're bringing the kingdom uh, of god's beloved son 
into the kingdom of darkness. And so there is a spiritual conflict there. Now, power directions. It's interesting that Muslims have a tradition that on the right shoulder is one angel. And that angel records a person's good deeds. And on the left shoulder, there's an angel who records one's bad deeds. And then after this life is over, there's called the Yom al qayyama the day of resurrection, or the Yom Adin, the day of judgment. And those angels give an account. So the Muslims, they also think when they get good deeds, we talked last week about the scales. The good deeds are heavily weighing blessings on the right shoulder, and the bad deeds are on the left shoulder. So there's two reasons to try to, if you have a gift for Muslims, give it with the right hand. You see some of these people ministering here, giving a gift to Muslims with the right hand. The left hand is considered unclean, only for personal cleaning. So uh, you keep that in mind, and it, it, this is true in some cultures that are not even Muslims as well, but something to remember. So the power encounter here is in response to all of this, we worship Jesus who has the power of life and resurrection. Now, sometimes in the spiritual warfare, we are hit with an enemy attack. Believe in Jesus to hit the enemy back with the counterpunch. So in your, um, in your ministry among Muslims, you might receive a lot of spiritual warfare, could even be curses, could be uh, things put against you, but Jesus Christ is more powerful. We, uh, even in New York, uh, where I had served, um, there was a ministry training center. Uh, and this center would teach English to Arabic women who had just arrived. They were mostly Muslim. And the center was on the second floor. And there was a period of time when several of the women we're falling down the stairs. Uh, and this was more than you would think could be coincidental. And that's the team, the staff was looking and they found that in the concrete or the cement of the, of the stair, someone had put a curse in Arabic. Anyone who goes here should be cursed. And somehow these people were falling down. Well, they took that curse away. They took the paper away. They said, in the blood of Jesus, we break that. In the name of Jesus, we break that curse. And then the problem lifted. So we believe in Jesus and in his victory. Now, uh, the last section, we do it dealing with blessings and cursings and dreams. So the biblical bless, uh, concept of blessing, we know very well from, for example, Ephesians 1.3, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This word for blessing in Greek is eulogos, meaning uh, the good word. So that is a powerful impartation. Jesus blessed the children. Jesus blessed the disciples. Jesus spoke the good word. And this word had power. This had the power. And you have the ability to bless Muslims with your good word. And uh, Islam does not have the same principle. It has a word, Barakat, which means uh, blessing, or sometimes it means power. This is related to the Hebrew word Baruch. And you remember Jeremiah in the book of Jeremiah had a friend or a colleague named Baruch. This is the word that means blessing. And uh, we should bless our Muslim friends, these cousins, if you want to call them that, with prayers, with friendship, with sharing the gospel with them. Um, cursing, of course, is the opposite of blessing. Uh, we both religions teach that blessing and cursing is real. The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, in folk Islam, people are living in fear of being cursed. So in some cases, it's through the envious eye. If you're casting an envious eye, then uh, the cursing could happen. Now, some Muslim scholars are going to have to determine uh, can the evil eye be cast through Zoom or does Zoom filter out the evil eye? Maybe there's a filter here, Norma, on this Zoom room for it to filter out the evil eye. I don't know. But the Muslims would be always afraid. Uh, I'm being a little funny here to try to just liven it up. Uh, the Muslims are afraid of being cursed. They're afraid their animals might die, their children might die, their women may become unable to bear children. And if that's the case, 
most likely it's not a material cause, it's a spiritual cause of some kind of curse. Now, this is a lot of fear. People would live in a lot of fear, and this fear is the opposite of love. Love is waging war against fear. And we want Muslims to know that great love of God, the love of God that is victorious also. Dreams. Now, uh, I just woke up uh, before the meeting. I woke up a few hours early, but we're in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I don't remember if I had any dreams. I probably did, but I didn't remember them. Uh, but in many parts of the world, especially Muslims, uh, people hold a lot of stock. They had a lot of importance in dreams. Even Osama bin Laden, you know, it's interesting because um, bin Laden, who's deceased, of course, now, um, he was a jihadist and they wanted to make him the caliph. But he said, you know, the caliph of the Muslim world should be a very well-respected cleric, a uh, theological scholar. And I don't have that kind of background. I don't have that kind of training. Uh, and but what he would do is when he was in the caves with his uh, fighters, even in Afghanistan, he would sit in the cave and he would interpret their dreams. So that was his claim to spirituality. And uh, dreams are important. You may find a series um, called More Than Dreams. And there's a wonderful story of an Indonesian girl named Dini. And it's in Bahasa. Have anyone seen that story of Dini, More Than Dreams? If you haven't seen it and you speak Bahasa, it's also subtitled in other languages. Very powerful uh, dreams. Jesus appeared to her in a dream while she was trying to pray the Islamic prayer. Uh, many accounts in the Bible, God speaking to people through dreams. We see about Joseph being warned in a dream to flee to Egypt and other occasions as well. Now, it's good to develop a theology of dreams. Do we have one? Well, Muslims are having dreams and visions of Jesus. Very few of them are having positive dreams of Muhammad. And so what is our theology of dreams? Is the word of God better than a dream? Um, Moses talked about that in Numbers 12. But you could help. Muslim, sometimes Muslims will say that they've had a dream. And it seems very clear that God gave them the dream. And you might be able to help them by interpreting the dream. So this comes to our conclusion. Uh, we have the ultimate response to the power and counter of folk Islam. What is that response? The blood of Jesus Christ, the almighty God, the power of the Holy Spirit. And we saw in the Muslim world, as I mentioned last week, the first great move of God among Muslims was, uh, let's say in, in big numbers, was in Indonesia. And this was reported or at least narrated by uh, Mel Terry, uh, like a mighty wind. And this is the kind of move we want to see happening. It is happening in other part people. So I'm going to get up now for uh, comments and questions. Uh, you can post your questions in the chat or uh, some can unmute if that is possible to do the questions. And I will go out of the share screen now. And uh, then we'll be in the room again. And I will try to open the chat. Yes. Uh, well, first I would say I'm very happy to hear uh, of the church um, and these people, yourselves, moving in healing. Uh, if, you, if you enter the university or secondary school, you know at the end of the term you're going to have an exam. Yeah? And they'll say the exam is going to be such and such a date, and you prepare. Well, suddenly, with the pandemic, the church had a big exam, but it wasn't scheduled or it wasn't announced. And that exam was, do we believe <clears throat> and do we have the power in the name of Jesus for healing? Because we almost have a priesthood now of medical people. And they try to say that this is, we can shut down the world because we have to do it. But if you can minister in healing and the, the folk Muslims, they want to see that, then in the, in the COVID time, then that will be very powerful. Now, certainly, um, a miracle or a healing uh, or any miracle of God could be blocked spiritually by idolatry in the heart of the person who is, couldn't receive the miracle if they have idolatry. And so, in general, yes, you will have to be very um, careful uh, with objects. 
Uh, I think there was a question about a Quran. Uh, the Quran could, the Muslims believe it has power, uh, spiritual power. Excuse me. Um, our belief usually with the Bible is that <clears throat> it's not the paper and the ink on the Bible or the leather cover or whatever cover that have the spiritual power. So it doesn't mean if you sleep under your pillow with a Bible, you're going to be saved from illness. It's the power spiritually of those words, not the physical. Um, but in animism, what people do is they invite spirits to embody something. So let's say, you know, say this pastor, you know, he used this pencil and, you know, this was so famous because some pastor used this pencil and then that thing becomes an idol. In fact, uh, about in the time of the origination of Islam, the Christians would travel from, especially from Europe, but from other places too, to the Holy Land to get what they call relics. These they considered a hair from the donkey that John the Baptist rode in, or a piece of the cross was considered very powerful. Uh, any of these relics, they would take them and they would make an altar to that relic, and they call that a holy thing. And the people would play the idolatry. They would, they would play the harlot. They would prostrate themselves in front of these objects because they felt they had spiritual power. Now, the question comes, what is the power? So, now, I don't know, in some cultures, maybe every family has a spear, okay, because they need that for hunting. But do they think that that thing has spiritual power? Have they opened their will to give it spiritual power? And uh, even in the case of uh, Jacob in the Bible, uh, there, was, there was household idols. Even he was supposed to be a God worshiper. Some of his wives had those. Uh, so we have to be very careful with gifts. And if we get a gift, we could ask people, what is the significance of this gift? Does this have any significance? Uh, and if they say, yes, this represents the power of some spirit or whatever, then you would know, um, be very careful with that thing. And you have to bring the blood of Jesus against it. So uh, to answer the question briefly, it would take discerning of spirits. Yes. So suppose you want to minister to Muslims and you get a Quran so you can study it. So you can minister to Muslims. That Quran most likely is not going to have spiritual power over you because you are under the blood of Jesus and you're preparing yourself to share the gospel. But we would be very careful with objects and sometimes people give them as gifts and we would have to have discernment. And if you feel unsettled in your spirit or you have a word that this object is animistic or there's evil power, then get the thing uh, away from yourself and your family. Um, you know, we do know around the world, a lot of pastors have died from COVID. Um, is it because we're weak spiritually? Is it because we're not moving in healing? I don't know. I know most pastors, they tend to be older in general than young youth. Youth people are not usually pastors. Uh, and the youth, the COVID does not touch the youth as much, but it touches the older people. Um, and, you know, so um, I, I wouldn't say in a general way that, you know, pastors are being judged but that, um, you know, I'm glad to hear that you're moving in healing because there is a big need for that in full Islamic ministry and especially in the time of COVID. So mm -hmm. uh, that was that question. And I'm going to keep going because I went a little long on the question. Uh, thank you, Brother Lawrence. That was very important. Um, someone has asked about uh, the black stone. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the Kaaba, it's very interesting that the Muslims say that in this house of worship, there were 360 idols. And when Muhammad came back to Mecca from Medina and they, he conquered, so to speak, Mecca, and he received the authority over the Kaaba, they got all of the objects out of there except this black stone. And um, so the Qibla, yeah, the direction of prayer would be, uh, Mecca would be the power place. So Qibla means the direction of prayer. But it's, a, it's an inconsistency in Islam. So Islam rejects idols. And why in the Kaaba then is there this black stone? And Muslims have a hard time uh, explaining it. They wouldn't say that it has 
a power, but why is it in there? And why do they want to kiss it or touch it? Uh, it? It really is an idol. I mean, we would all say this is an idol, but the Muslims themselves would struggle to understand that because they say, absolutely, uh, idol worship in Islam is a very big sin. They call this shirk, associating partners with Allah. And those who are idol worshipers are called mushrikun or mushrikeen. So uh, this, this would be considered a big problem in Islam. And it's an inconsistency in Islam. Why do they allow the black stone in the Kaaba? Someone has uh, made a comment that the toilet is where all the jinn stay. Uh, he has heard this. So that you could hear also. Um, I'm reading this on the chat because some later would listen to the message and they wouldn't know the chat box. Uh, someone asked if they give us a Quran and ask us to read. Okay, that could be the power object. We talked about it. Now the question comes, sometimes a Muslim will say, I want you to read the Quran or I'll read the Bible if you read the Quran. Would you study both? That's a question we would have to ask if you would be willing to do that. I, at first, I, would be, I want to be sure that the person is sincere about reading the Bible. Sometimes the Muslims may just say, could you read the Quran? Uh, you, it's helpful if you've read through the Quran, if you're in, in serious ministry to Muslims, you can say, I've read the Quran. Uh, I know what it says. So you would have that going. I'm looking through the chat box also. Um, some people have watched them more than dreams of Dini. I recommend it. Okay. Now, uh, when Muslims mention the name of the prophet Muhammad, they say, peace be upon him. Specifically, the, the expression is Sallallahu Allahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you hear devout Muslims talk, you'll hear them say, they will not say the name of Prophet Muhammad, or whenever they say Muhammad, very fast, you hear them say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right after the name of Muhammad. If they talk like that, you know they're a devout Muslim. Now, why do they do this? Well, the Muslims say it's just an honorific. So when they say the name Jesus, they give him the honorary title by saying, alayhi as-salam, upon him be peace. So they say for Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it's, the real meaning is, um, it is prayed that Allah would preserve him. So if I take the Arabic word, sallah, prayer, Allahu, sallallahu, Allah is God, alayhi, upon Muhammad, is is preservation. So this expression, when they translate it, peace be upon him, really it's, it is prayed that Allah would preserve him. Now, this could be an indication, perhaps, that Muslims don't believe in assurance of salvation because they're praying for the preservation of Muhammad, who is the most holy man, according to Islam. Uh, but the Muslims will say, this is just an honorific title. We do this out of respect, just like we do for Jesus and say, Jesus Christ, Isa Messiah, alayhi salam. If the people are using that expression and if they say the name Allah, sometimes they'll say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whom we lift up and exalt. If they use those honorifics, they're probably a very religious Muslim. Um, okay. Um, the, someone asked, what is jinn? Okay, jinn are a spirit, okay? It's a kind of a spirit that is in Islam, but it's not in the Bible. So in the Bible, we have God. We have humans that have a soul and a spirit, but we have angels, good spirits, and then we have demons. They're fallen angels. We have not more than that. Islam has two other classifications of spirits. One is jinn who they are considered mischievous spirits, but they're very near people. So people talk to jinn. Sometimes people fall in love with jinn. Sometimes they think jinn can be manifest. And so uh, they have this uh, expression that these jinn are spirits. And the Arabic expression, which you hear in a lot of Muslim languages, is majnun. That means possessed by jinn, but it's the general word for crazy. So if, if someone gone crazy, they say mejnun, which literally means possessed by jinn. And then someone is asked, what is the word kafir? Kafir is a disbeliever or unbeliever. And the word kuf in Arabic, it's a religious word that means unbelief. Okay. Um, someone has asked the question, 
what is the view of the Salafi Wahhabis toward folk Islam? They try to get those things out of Islam, but they, they have a hard time doing it because they're partially embedded in Islam and also because they don't have the power to break these, uh, these issues of fear that folk Muslims are dealing with. So you can say that even the most of the fundamental Muslims, they're still very folk Muslim in some way or another. Most of them believe in the evil eye, for example. I um, appreciate you sharing those things. And um, that actually segues into a few more questions that have been posted. Someone asked, do you think it is advisable to debate with people like Zakir Nayak, who's a famous Islamic apologist based out of India? And uh, to Sister Norma's point, now most of us are not going to be invited to debate with like the most famous Muslim apologist in the world. But uh, you might have discussions, conversations, maybe the word debate is not the best word. Uh, normally in political debates, it strengthens the belief of the partisans of each side. What our desire is particularly is not only to defend the Christian faith, but also to help Muslims become more open to the gospel. But I would say that yes, in general, it is better to interact whenever we can and we should prepare ourselves. So if you're going to debate or have a forum, if interfaith discussion, and some people that are very uh, well prepared Islamic apologists like a Zechar Naik, um, is participating, that person is going to be very well prepared and they are going to know how to critique Christianity. And therefore, we would have to know what those Islamic arguments are. And for that reason, we should have uh, known the basic teachings of Islam. But I think it's in, it, wherever you can get interfaith interaction, it's a good thing uh, unless you can see that the situation has been stacked such that its only purpose is to promote, promote Islam. But, and this happens sometimes when the Muslims, they will try to get a Christian to participate that knows nothing about Islam, and then they don't know how to answer certain questions, and it looks like Islam wins. But sometimes, even if the Christian doesn't know about Islam, they still, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can lead Muslims to Christ. So it's, it's good to entertain those. Again, you have to be careful that you're not led into a situation where they're trying to get you to maybe speak badly about Muhammad or the Quran or something where it could be a trap. Like that's what they did to Jesus so much. They tried to trap him and he, he saw those things coming. So you don't want to get Christians in trouble unnecessarily. Um, another question has posed about what is the Muslim idea of self-sacrifice? Yeah, so the, the Arabic word for self-sacrifice is called feda. And you will, you will hear, there used to be in Iraq, um, some of Saddam Hussein's supporters called Fedayin Saddam. Uh, and you see in Iran, there's some people called Fedayin, those who sacrifice themselves. And um, so this is Islamic idea because in Islam, a person wants to get good deeds on the right shoulder. I don't know if the Zoom is reversing me to the right or to the left, but whatever the case is, uh, the Muslims want to get good deeds. Now, if you sacrifice yourself, that's considered like the best good deed you can do. So if you sacrifice yourself, you get a lot of good deeds. According to classical Islam, you still won't know for sure if you'll go to heaven or if you maybe have to go to purgatory for a while. Uh, but that's one of the ideas of the self-sacrifice. We would sacrifice ourselves for our Muslim neighbor. We would sacrifice ourselves for the love of God. And, and let me say that many Muslims are very... Uh, when, they, when the person typed the question about self-sacrifice, I thought this is, they're talking about like martyrs and jihadists. But many Muslims will lay down their life to help you and bless you. And many Muslims are very hospitable and very friendly and they would do anything to help a person. So, you know, uh, there was a joke before the meeting started. Somebody said someone was Americanized and they said, maybe I'm Americanized. What should that mean? If things start going badly, I'll leave the room, you know, uh, doesn't mean that. But uh, you find Muslims will, uh, you know, be so um, happy to serve you in many cases and bless you. Um, in some cases, they want to expand Islam, but many kind of cases, they just are sincerely friendly. 
uh, okay, there are no verse in the Bible to say Jesus is God specifically. Muslims always challenge us. How do you handle that? Well, uh, there are no verse in the Quran that says the Shahada. <laughs> so they will say, how can you believe in Trinity when the Trinity is not in the Bible? How can you believe in uh, Jesus being God where he does not say those three words, I am God. They say, show me those three words where Jesus says, I am God. We were having um, a, a meeting one time in University of Texas, some open forums, and some Muslims were there from Saudi Arabia, and they said the same thing. And I said, okay, uh, I have an Arabic Bible with me. Um, you're, you're right that you don't find those three words, Jesus saying, I am God, but the Quran doesn't have Shahada in it written exactly like that. That's the Islamic confession of faith. So what does this mean? So what I did is I said, gentlemen, you're very intelligent. I can see that by the nature of our discussion. I will give you this Arabic Bible and I want you to read Mark chapter two, the first 10 or 11 verses where Jesus heals the man who's let down through the roof by his friends. And uh, those who are watching, you know, they say, uh, Jesus says to the man, your sins are forgiven. And uh, the, the Jewish religious leaders and others are saying, what is this guy doing? Who can forgive sins but God alone, right? You remember that. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, oh, <laughs> you know, don't get it wrong. Don't, you misunderstood me. I'm not God. I'm just uh, saying something and let me explain it. But no, Jesus says the opposite, right? He says, what is easier to do? To say to someone, your sins are forgiven or take up your bed or your pallet and walk. Because I can say to everyone here, uh, you know, I, I don't want to name the names. I can read the names and say, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. No one really knows, right? No one really knows. But if, if I declare healing and the person is not healed, everyone will know I'm a fake. Everyone will know I'm an imposter. So Jesus will say, what is easier to say? Take up your bed and walk or your sins are forgiven. Of course, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. And then Jesus says this, in order that you may know, that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins, which everyone said only God can do. In order that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man is healed, the paralytic. He's proving. And I told the, uh, I just told the man, I said, read this story. And you tell me, you don't have to believe Jesus is God. You don't have to believe his son of God or anything, but just, Tell me if you think the Bible teaches that Jesus is God and that Jesus taught himself to be God. And I will give you the microphone and any one of these meetings, we're having meetings all week here, you can share what you found, but they didn't return. Uh, so that is one example, Mark chapter two. And you wanna have a whole list of scriptures, a whole list of examples where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, they took up stones to stone him because they, he says, why do you stone me? And he said, and the Jewish people said, we do not stone you for a sign. We stone you because you being a man declare yourself to be God. So uh, the, all the people there that were trying to kill Jesus understood what he was saying. And you can ask Muslims to read the Bible and say, okay, would you read the Bible and tell me how you interpret that? Um, I think we have gotten to the end of the uh, chat questions and that maybe in my last breath hopefully not last breath on this earth but last breath in this meeting we talked about in the beginning that malaysia um video and the people being imprisoned in the re-education camps and i mentioned last week that according to some surveys the operation world one and i know it's hard to verify the numbers it's hard to verify the numbers um but the, the one thing I want to say is I did a study during the week on Operation uh, World's list of fastest growing churches and compared it to Open Doors persecution list. Have you heard of the top persecuted countries? So they usually publish 50 every, what are the top 50 countries in persecution? And I put those in a document and I hope you can see it. Um, and you'll see this that 
Uh, on the right side are the number one, two, three, four, five uh, fastest growing churches. We mentioned Iran, number one, Afghanistan, two, Gambia, number three. On the left, and I'm sorry, this is only in English. I just did this yesterday. And the left are the countries with highest persecution, North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea. Now, on the persecution side, uh, there's uh, usually about 35 to 40 of the top 50 are Muslim countries. That's been the case every year. And usually the, the Muslim majority countries, they don't have much church growth. But you'll see that the Islamic persecution is still continuing. And in fact, 28 of the top 40 countries in terms of persecution is rated by Open Doors. They're Muslim majority countries or it's Islamic persecution like in Nigeria. But look here on the church growth side, 19 of the top 40 countries in the world in church growth by percentage are Muslim majority countries. And this has to be grounds for rejoicing. This has to be grounds for uh, pr praising the Lord that even a generation ago when I was a new Christian, there were many countries, there were no known believers. And now these countries are, are even found in the, some of the fastest growing churches, even though they may have few Christians. Of course, uh, you know, the, the church could be growing like in Afghanistan, it's growing fast, but now they have a persecution, but um, the number could be small if we compare it to China or Brazil or United States. But the good news is that the prayers and the missionary work is working. The persecution is not destroying or eliminating the church, but even in Muslim majority countries where there's high persecution, there is still the potential and the possibility of church growth. So you have, you know, Mauritania here. When I was a young Christian, they said there was no known believers in Mauritania. Now Mauritania is the 12th fastest growing church in the world. Still, it may be small numbers, but the church is growing and missionaries are succeeding. Prayer is succeeding. Uh, internet is succeeding and it doesn't mean everything is going perfect it doesn't mean everything is going great but it means the gospel is growing so i share that as encouragement and even for those in malaysia in this serious situation that in jesus in hebrews chapter 7 verse 16 it says that in jesus is the power of an indestructible life in hebrews 7 16 in jesus is the power of an indestructible life and that indestructible life is in you. That indestructible life is in believers in Jesus from Muslim background. And yes, our physical body is going to die. Everyone in this room, unless the Lord returns, someday you're going to die. I hope it's not COVID. I hope it's not cancer. I hope you live to 100 years. But we know this physical tent at some point is going to be laid aside and we're going to be getting ready for glory. But the life of Jesus, that spiritual life is indestructible. And that's the life that Muslims need. So they don't have to uh, rely on charms and magic and witch doctors, but the blood of Jesus Christ, the salvation and that great love we're sharing with Jesus. So we're living in times of harvest. We're living in times of uh, tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And even with the COVID, you know, the big question for the Muslims is what to make of the COVID. Is this from Allah and et cetera? So uh, what I'll do is I'm going to turn it back over to Sister Norma. If she has any other comments or questions for me, um, fine. If not, it's been such a blessing being with you the last two weeks. And uh, we're praying for you in South Asia. And I hope to see you there or in Southeast Asia at some time in the future. And whatever we can do to serve you, we'll do that. You can contact us through uh, Norma. And uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you.